We are reading through the book of Mark at the moment, and uh, we come to uh, the transfiguration experience of Jesus, and that's found in Mark chapter 9. And if you're visiting, uh, please feel free to have a look at the message guide in front of you there. And when it comes to the words in bold, I um, welcome the congregation to, to read them. So it's Mark chapter 9, verses 1 through 13. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that kingdom of God has come with power. After six days... Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. This is the word of the Lord. So Lord, uh, we just like to thank you for the words of this passage. And Lord, we'd like to thank you that they are recorded for us that Peter, James, and John had this mountaintop experience with Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. And Lord, uh, we know that as we go on through life, we will have mountaintop experiences. But then you always bring us down to the valley. And when we go down to the valley, sometimes we wonder if you are around. So Lord, we pray that you will help us understand this passage as we read it today. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will come to our hearts and touch us with these words so that when we leave today, we will be able to say that we met Christ and his Holy Spirit this morning. And Lord, you know that I'm a mere human being. And so, Lord, we pray that you will supernaturally come upon us right now, that what goes forth from here is the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when my brother and I were in our early teens, uh, mom and dad used to send us to one of these Christian camps run by the parachurch ministry called Scripture Union. They were called Camp Friendship. So for the 70s, that was probably quite a pretty uh, exciting name. Uh, they, they were named in the Malaysian language. And it was held in the hills. Now, uh, there are no mountains in Malaysia. Uh, you just go to the hills. And because we are in a tropical climate, uh, you, you, you won't find snow coming down on the mountains. Uh, you go to the hills in Malaysia so that you can experience the cold weather. And these camp friendships were held in a retreat center that could house 150 teenagers in, in dormitories. Um, and so it's called uh, Camp Friendship because we were to invite all our friends to this camp, uh, and they came from all over Malaysia, uh, whether they believed in Jesus or not. And it was a thrill to see some of our friends give their lives to Jesus at Camp Friendship. And uh, during the, uh, some of the days, we would go for, for hikes in the Malaysian jungle. 
uh, I want to confess that I'm a city brat, okay? I don't like to get my feet dirty and all that kind of stuff. So going on Camp Friendship kind of introduced me to the Malaysian jungles, uh, which I probably never had to experience if it weren't for Camp Friendship. And there were Bible teachers who taught in the mornings and in the evenings, and at night, uh, it was dark on the hill, and uh, the whole church retreat center will be lit up. And we would listen to these Bible teachers talk about, you know, what Jesus did and how he appeared, but perhaps even in the transfiguration to his disciples. And so you could see down below, and you could see the, if you like, the darkness of life down below. And you were here in the church retreat center listening to these Bible teachers with your best friends, and life couldn't be better. Life couldn't be better. Uh, listening to the light of God's words. And in, in some ways, it was like a transfiguration experience, you know, Jesus coming in dazzling white, because we would see Jesus, if you like, uh, in the stories that were told to us uh, at Camp Friendship. Now, as in all Camp experiences, you go down to the valley after Camp Friendship to the homes below. Firstly, the weather in Kuala Lumpur is hot and humid, not cool and refreshing. And uh, it was good to be your friends from all over Malaysia for that week, but you would cry uh, when, you, uh, uh, when camp friendship was over. You cry and you wait for next year's camp friendship in which you would be able to see uh, your friends again. And we would go back to the world of reality in Kuala Lumpur as fully devoted followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then within a week, in the hot, humid weather, the zeal to keep on reading the Bible was lost. Uh, you had to do homework. You went back to your homes, and if you went back to a dysfunctional home, you forget about your camp friendship experiences and be involved in the struggles of the dysfunctional home. And then you look back two weeks later, and you wish that camp friendship never ended. You wished that camp friendship lasted forever in your lives. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter, James, and John just had a great camp friendship experience and they wished it lasted forever so they proposed to Jesus why don't we build shelters for you and Elijah and Moses so that we can preserve this camp friendship experience that, so that we can live forever in the great mountaintop of life now you got to remember about the context of Mark chapter 9 here in the last part of Mark chapter 8 Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. This is a pivotal point in the book of Mark. Uh, everyone's wondering who is this great miracle healer in the form of the person Jesus. And then bang, Peter says, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ to come. You are the anointed king who is going to save Israel. And then Jesus does something that nobody predicted. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is a code word for the Messiah, as I taught to you, based on uh, the, the word Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And so Peter then tells them that this Messiah that they're going to receive in the form of him is going to be a suffering Messiah. And not only is he going to be a suffering Messiah, he's going to die. And then he later on calls the crowd, and this is what he says. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow him. Take up their cross and follow him. Now we have used the symbol of the cross as something very romantic 
uh, because and, and, and maybe we should cherish the cross. But in those days, if you saw someone walking with the cross on the streets of Jerusalem, you knew that that person was a hardened criminal, that he probably killed someone or he probably rose, against, uh, rose up against Rome, and he was carrying the cross to his execution on the cross, in which he will die a cruel death. So when Jesus calls the crowd and says, whoever wants to follow me must take up the cross, it's counter to the vision of a king to come. He's saying to them, if you want to follow me, you must be willing to be classified as a hardcore Roman criminal enough to die a cruel death on the cross. And so these thoughts were very uh, difficult to take in the part of my disciples. And then later on at the start of the passage that we have just read, Jesus says to them, Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see that kingdom of God has come with power. So what is Jesus promising here when he says that the, they will not taste death until the kingdom of God has come with power? Then later on in verse 2, Mark tells us that after six days, they go up this mountain top, and then Jesus is transformed before their eyes. His clothes become dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking with Jesus. In the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, a mountaintop is viewed as a throne for a king. So that is why Jerusalem is sometimes called Mount Zion the throne of Yahweh, our king. So for Peter, James, and John, number one, they are up on top, a mountain top. Number two, Jesus has been transformed into something beyond this world. His clothes have become dazzling white. And so for Peter, James, and John, it is a moment for them to behold because finally, finally it is starting to make sense Jesus is not the suffering Messiah. Jesus is now possibly becoming the king on the throne with his clothes dazzling white. We've all had those experiences before, haven't we? We've been to summer camps and quizzing weekends in which we meet up with our friends who are living all over the province We've never received God's word the way we did at camp or quizzing weekends. Not to forget those inspiring worship in song sessions. And then it was all over. We had to leave the Bible conference grounds and wish we never had to leave. We cry and we hug our friends, saying goodbye to them until next year when we have our next camp friendship or Bible quizzing weekend. We wish we didn't have to leave. We wish that the camp lasted forever. So now we understand why Peter asked if he could build three shelters uh, for Jesus, for Elijah, and for Moses. He wanted that transfiguration experience to last forever, um, especially since Jesus, with his transforming clothes before them, is now beginning to look like the king the true Messiah which we have waited for all these thousands of years as the people of Israel. Do we try to build shelters for Jesus in our lives? Do we try to box him in for our convenience? Do we sometimes ask God to follow a formula in our lives that he has previously blessed us with? In April, I will go and see my urologist. It is now an annual visit in April. And I have to take a PSA test before I go visit my urologist. And as you all know, I have survived two prostate biopsies. And I have shared with you many times how God has blessed me to confirm 
after these biopsies that I have no cancer in my prostate gland. And when I go and see my urologist in April, how I wish that God would repeat that formula that my PSA test will say that I have not exceeded a particular number uh, that would require me to do another prostate biopsy. How I wish that God would repeat that formula in my life. But I can tell you, I will pray for God to protect me, but I cannot truly say that the formula of my past two prostate biopsies will continue. I put my life into God's hands. Mountaintop experiences are not restricted to camps and spiritual retreats. God blesses us with mountaintop experiences even in the life down below. We may experience these mountaintop uh, situations on a Sunday service at small group or at the end of our personal Bible devotional reading. And we might even uh, experience them when God answers our prayers for healing for a disease or for a job we've been waiting for for a long time. And we all have experiences like this in our lives, don't we? Our backs are against the wall. We have no one else to turn to except God and we pray to God, God, help me. God, bless me. God, save me from this situation. And at that moment, he saves us from that situation. And it is as if Jesus is in front of us with his clothes transformed into dazzling white. It is a mountaintop experience. Suddenly, they looked around. They no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. Gone are Jesus' clothes of dazzling white. Gone are Elijah and Moses. Gone is the sense of God being present. It is just a quiet mountain. It is just Jesus and them without any bright revelation wearing ordinary clothes. It has returned to the normal humdrum of life. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So not only is the transfiguration experience gone, Jesus has reverted back to his secretive ways. They are not to tell anyone about the transfiguration until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. Oh, come on, Jesus. What do you mean by being risen from the dead? What is this, this Jesus talking about? And I'm sure that Peter is getting frustrated with Jesus again. Sometimes this Jesus, in his quiet, secretive ways, just doesn't make sense. And what is the promise at the end of the Old Testament? See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And so therefore, since they have seen the real Elijah from the Old Testament, uh, the three disciples are now full of hope that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is coming. And so they ask him, why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? And they ask him this question because they have seen the real Elijah and they remember about this verse found in Malachi. And so maybe, maybe this great and dreadful day of the Lord will come and maybe this Jesus will be enthroned as the great Messiah after all and he will come to judge 
the people, especially those cruel, wicked Romans who are controlling us at the moment. Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished, just as it is written about him. Jesus quashes all their hopes about instituting the great and dreadful day of the Lord in the not-too-distant future. On the contrary, he returns back to his theme of the Messiah needing to suffer much and be rejected. He also says that this Elijah has come and has restored all things. However, this Elijah who has come suffers and is rejected like this suffering Messiah. This Elijah who has come suffers like the original Elijah who was persecuted by the wicked Queen Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. So you can see from this uh, conversation at the end of the passage we read today that Jesus is now clearly telling them that there are two Elijahs in this story. The first one is the original Elijah whom they had seen in the transfiguration talking with Jesus. However, there is a second Elijah. A second Elijah who has just come and suffered. And so you know, and we have studied about this when we went through um, uh, this, uh, the Advent series, that the second Elijah is John the Baptist. And you know that John the Baptist was beheaded by King Herod Antipas. He also suffered the same fate as the person he was witnessing to. So what was the purpose of this second Elijah, John the Baptist? And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am worthy, not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The second Elijah comes and suffers and dies. And as he does, in some ways he is, if you like, a foretaste of the real suffering Messiah, because the real suffering Messiah, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, will also suffer and die and be executed. And this second Elijah will say that this Jesus, this Messiah, this suffering Messiah will come and baptize them with the Holy Spirit and show them the words of the new covenant. Now, Mark is careful to point out that it's after six days after Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah, that they go up a high mountain for transfiguration. So the question is this, is there any significance that Mark would underline in 9 verse 2, I believe, that it was after 6 days? So let me refer you back to Exodus, to the time when God is ratifying the covenant that he has given to Israel. When Moses went up, to, on the mountain, the cloud covered it. Notice there's a cloud here in the ratification of the covenant with, with Israel. And the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days, the cloud covered the mountain. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. And so like Peter, James, and John, the original Moses who appeared at the transfiguration also had a transfiguration experience in Exodus 24. And notice, like the transfiguration, the cloud covered Mount Sinai. And notice, like this transfiguration, after six days, on the seventh day, God calls out to Moses from within the cloud. And so now Mark is careful to point is after six days after six days peter has confessed jesus as messiah but jesus then says that he's going to be the suffering messiah then on this seventh day like moses they go up a mountain and what happens when they go up the mount of transfiguration the cloud covers them like the cloud covered mount sinai and then a voice comes from the cloud this is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. 
This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. God calls out to Moses from a cloud at Mount Sinai to confirm the covenant, the promise, the testament that he has started with Israel. And now God tells Peter, James, and John that Jesus is the Moses-like figure to God, to whom God calls out to confirm the new covenant that he's setting up. Hence, new covenant, new testament. The second part of the Bible covers this new covenant, this new testament. And so, in this Mount Sinai-like experience, experience of the transfiguration, Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, which they were revealed to the rest of the world later when Jesus is risen from the dead. This Jesus is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Listen to him speak forth my words for the new covenant, for the new testament. And so therefore, if you look back miraculously, 1,500 years earlier, okay? 1,500 years earlier in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, this Moses who appeared at the transfiguration, this Moses in 1,500 BC approximately predicts about this Son of God who is about to come. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from among from your fellow Israelites. And look at Moses' words here. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God nor see this great fire anymore or we will die. And it was an awesome experience at Mount Sinai which confirmed it. And it was an awesome experience at the Transfiguration that confirmed that, if you like, Jesus is Moses part two. But he is more than Moses part two because he is the true son of God. This is my son whom I love. This is my son whom I sent forth to you from heaven. And just as Moses said about this prophet to come, Listen to him. 1,500 years earlier, God the Father is telling Peter, James, and John, listen to him, my beloved son. So right now, we do not have Jesus. No, we do not, sorry, we do have Jesus in our hearts, but we do not have Jesus standing in front of us with clothes of dazzling white. Instead, you know what do we have? We have mere bread and mere cup. Just bread and cup. And yet these symbols remind us of the Son of Man who suffered and was betrayed by the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law. And they handed him to Pontius Pilate who tried him like a hardcore criminal of Rome and sentence him to die on the cross. This meal reminds us of Jesus carrying his cross. And in fact, these are the words that Jesus used to describe the meal which we are about to partake as the family of God. While they were eating, Jesus took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the wine until that day I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so in some ways, this meal before us proclaims the new covenant of the Son of God, whom God loves, whom we must listen to. And this meal here uh, makes us look back towards Calvary, Calvary, to the hill 
where there were three crosses of which Jesus' cross was one of them. And it reminds us that each time we partake of it, we are reminded that Jesus is the Son of God who came to die for our sins. Now, we have now come to this meal, and so therefore, as often as we partake of this meal, it is a very quiet moment. Yes, there'll be some uh, music to help us uh, uh, help think about the cross, but it'll be a quiet moment. And remember the experience of Jesus and his disciples. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. So my prayer is that when you partake of this meal right now, you will remember that it is Jesus who has died for us. And when you partake of this, may you, of this meal, you will see no one except Jesus in your hearts. So now I invite the praise team to come and lead us uh, to, uh, to prepare for this family meal which we are about to partake of. It has been a privilege for me to um, share this meal with you for the last seven years of my ministry here. And I've always thought that the communion is an extension of the word. I've always thought because of the words of Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I've always thought that not only is the Lord's death proclaimed through the word, but in some mysterious way, the Lord's death is also proclaimed through this meal. In some ways, this meal is an extension of the word. That Jesus is saying to you, come, I died for your sins at Calvary. Come, and as you partake of this meal, and as you are reminded about Calvary, remember that I died for your sins to give you a new life. So I now invite Joy and her team to lead us in the uh, song before communion.